Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the GI tract. And today's lecture is going to focus on the esophagus. Before I start, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me such outstanding images through online collections or directly, which allow me to put these lectures together. First, we're going to look at some incidental and normal findings in the esophagus. As we all know, the esophagus is a long, largely muscular tube, primarily skeletal, with a small amount of smooth muscle which connects the oral cavity to the stomach. It's an unusual organ which has to put up with a gluttony of carnivore species which may increase its luminal diameter up to 500 percent as animals bolt their food. Some of the things that you might see in the normal esophagus are the transverse ridges in addition to the traditional longitudinal ridges that everybody's esophagus has. Cats in the distal part of the esophagus have these sort of transverse ridges as well which give it a herringbone pattern in the last 10 to 20 percent of its length. Some species have even otter linings to their esophagus. This is the esophagus of a green sea turtle which has these spike-like projections projecting downward toward the stomach. And it's thought that when the green sea turtle swallows food, it coughs up a lot of the water associated with it, or at least squeezes it up back out through the esophagus, and this prevents the food particles from moving back into the oral cavity. Pacific green turtles even have a muscular dilation at the juncture of the esophagus and the stomach, which nobody really understands what that's for, and it's called a crop. We're going to talk about the crop at the end of this lecture, which is a specialized modification of the esophagus in avian species. Here's an incidental finding in a dog. I would expect it more often in production animals, but there is pigmentation of the lining of the esophagus, and this is simply melanosis. It's a non-starter as far as pathology, an incidental finding of no, uh, no real significance. One thing that this slide allows me to do, however, is to show you the very white, thick lining of the esophagus. This is what we see in most of our mammalian species. Um, and the lining of the esophagus, especially when the esophagus is, is cut transversely, should clue you in that you are dealing with the esophagus. It is surrounded by a reddish muscular coat. We'll look at some slides that will allow us to examine it. But it's a very unique and characteristic gross appearance of the esophagus. So you, hopefully you'll never confuse a transverse section of the esophagus with intestine, blood vessel, or other tubular organs. Here's a lovely picture by Dr. Dr. Sarah Baluco, and the uh, the dog, especially as it ages, um, the esophagus is lined with uh, mucus glands, tubular mucus glands, which secrete a bit of mucus to help the esophagus contend with the large food bites that uh, dogs and other obligate carnivores will take to help it lubricate and go down. And uh, as dogs age, these glands may become very prominent, they may become cystic, but once again, this is an incidental finding and not of any clinical significance. Here's a nice cross section of the esophagus, and I want you just to take a quick look. Look at the thick lining of the, the keratinized mucosa of the esophagus, um, which helps a number of animal species get roughage down, so it's always going to be very thick. Now, the muscularis of the distal esophagus 
in this horse is extremely thickened. Um, this is fairly normal. This is quite abnormal. The addition of additional muscle fibers, the hyperplasia as well as the hypertrophy, has uh, has changed even the coloration of the muscle from this formal and fixed section, which in the normal animal would be sort of reddish here, it's sort of a tan, and it gets progressively lighter. So we've added a lot of cells, and by doing so, have changed the even the color. But uh, to get back to the lesion, this is distal esophageal hypertrophy in uh, in horses, and you can see this in horses. Um, and some people totally think of it as an incidental finding, but it may be associated with some clinical signs. You may have, uh, because of the extreme pressure that may be uh, uh, dilated, uh, or excuse me, that may be exerted by the esophagus proximal of this to force tissue through, you may get uh, pulsion diverticulus or outpouchings of the esophageal muscle proximal to this particular lesion. So they're not totally without uh, any type of uh, pathology. Horses can also have a similar lesion in the distal ilium as well, which I'm sure we'll take a look at when we get to that particular lecture. Here's a cool lesion in an outstanding picture by Dr. Kathy Fent. And there's a distinct line of demarcation between a very congested esophagus and a proximal, uh, sorry, a distal portion in which all of that blood has been squeezed out. And this is known as a bloat line. And the animal's dying of bloat. You will have congestion of the blood vessels of the esophagus. Congestion to me is not a significant pathologic finding in the vast majority of instances. People like to talk about it, but animals die, blood stops circulation, you get congestion. But the interesting part about this is this animal died of bloat, and as the rumen expands due to uh, the tremendous amount of gas that is produced, in many cases of gassy bloat, it pushes the uh, the blood out of this segment of the esophagus in proximity to the rumen into the adjacent esophagus and prevents it from draining back so you get this wonderful pale distal esophagus congested proximal esophagus and this is known as a bloat line uh, this can be uh, uh, seen not with this type of uh, of severity but you can see bloat lines which occur in the post-mortem state, so you want to make sure that you get to those animals early if you want to get a great picture like this. Okay, we are looking at the distal esophagus, and much of the lining has been eroded. This is a foal, but it could be just about any species and this is what happens when you have gastric reflux or reflux of the gastric acid past an incompetent sphincter into the lining of the esophagus. This is an extremely painful condition as anyone who has gastroesophageal reflux disease will tell you. When we see cases of gastric reflux in horses, we think about anything that is causing a delayed emptying of the stomach. In foals, it may often be the result of gastric ulceration and subsequent duodenal stenosis. In older horses, it may be the result of ulcers, of course, or may simply be the result of a dynamic ileus preventing the stomach from emptying properly. This is an image from a macaque and there is similar ulceration at the junction of the stomach and the esophagus. Once again gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, it is a stressful thing being a laboratory primate and 
Stress is also a very common cause of gastroesophageal reflux and subsequent ulceration. Other things that may contribute it are, to it are age, as the gastroesophageal sphincter tends to lose tone um, as animals and people age, obesity, and position. As we get older, uh, as humans, a lot of people are, uh, as they enter their fourth or fifth decade of life, will develop a degree of gastroesophageal reflux, which we call heartburn. And it's especially common at night as you lay down, and some of that material will leak out through a, uh, a gastroesophageal sphincter that doesn't close as well. So gastroesophageal reflux, not just the province of uh, humans, but we see it fairly commonly in the animal kingdom. Okay, moving on. Here is a case of a greatly dilated esophagus. There are two forms of megasophagus. Uh, one is a congenital form that is caused by a malpositioning of the great vessels, often called a persistent right aortic arch. In these cases, when the aorta develops from the right, not the left aortic arch, there is a ring that will be formed around the esophagus at the base of the heart, which is formed by the aorta, the pulmonary artery, and the ligamentum arteriosum, or the, the sort of uh, uh, strap-like remnant of the ductus arteriosus. This ring will not be seen if the aorta develops property from the left aortic arch. In cases of persistent right aortic arch, also known as vascular ring anomaly, a term I, I tend to prefer, um, the dilation of the esophagus is cranial to the obstruction at the base of the heart. This particular condition is most often seen in a number of, of breeds, including Irish setters, greyhounds, German shepherds, and Boston terriers. When there is no obstruction and the dilation of the esophagus occurs equally throughout its length, then we are largely considering an acquired case of megasophagus. These conditions are seen later on in life. You know, often when the animal's two, three, or four years of age, they take a while to develop to uh, the point where they become clinically apparent. There are an extremely wide uh, list of rule outs for cases of acquired megasophagus. One of which is myasthenia gravis, a condition in which antibodies are directed against the acetylcholine receptor. Other causes are polymyositis, in which you may see uh, uh, inflammation directed against muscle fibers in the esophagus, uh, as well as a number of other muscles throughout the body, including skeletal muscle, diaphragm, and even smooth muscle. Other causes would be a hypothyroidism, lead, thallium, hypoadrenocorticism or Addison's disease, Chagas disease, recurrent esophagitis, or recurrent gastric dilatation. With all of those potential causes, the vast majority of cases remain idiopathic when diagnostics are done. Interestingly enough, it's also very difficult histologically to identify megasophagus cases. Much more a uh, disease that's diagnosed by radiography or on gross inspection. And practitioners who submit biopsies may be disappointed because the most difficult change to identify 
is a diffuse change in the size of the muscle. So, acquired megasophagus, older animals look for it along the entire length of the, the esophagus. Another nice histologic clue if you get a full thickness biopsy of the, uh, the esophagus is that many of these animals uh, in terminal stages um, will have considerable ulceration of the esophagus with fungal infections and yeast infections in these areas of ulceration. Here's an absolutely marvelous picture by Dr. Laura Bryan at Texas A&M University. And this is a case of gastroesophageal hernia. Some people call it gastric inversion. It's a specialized form of intussusception in which the stomach, and we're looking at the rugae of the stomach here, um, actually goes into the distal esophagus. We have significant congestion. You can see the rugae here, and this tubular organ is the esophagus. Look how dilated it is. Pre-existing esophageal disease is suspected in a number of cases, usually not proven, but obviously if you have this dilated esophagus, it makes the stomach very likely to invert into it. This is usually seen in young dogs with deep chests, often German shepherds, and may be the sequela to a number of cases of previous gastric dilation. dilation. Um, most of these animals don't make it. Only a couple dogs historically have, have been documented in surviving symptoms longer than a week. When we talk about our production animals and horses, the most common esophageal disease in these species is choke. In the horses, causes of choke include consumption of, of unsoaked roughage, such as sugar beets, or animals that eat their roughage too quickly and do not chew it well, or animals that can't chew because they have, uh, uh, they have bad teeth. In cattle, choke usually occurs due to the ingestion of a single solid vegetable or fruit, such as a potato or a turnip or a corn cob. Esophageal obstruction in such cases usually occurs um, at areas where the esophagus deviates. It goes up or down or sideways, most commonly seen at the level of the thoracic inlet or the base of the heart or the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. This shows the ulceration that is associated with an acute choke. And the other thing that you need to consider in cattle who are choking is not so much at the moment the, uh, the damage that's being caused to the esophagus, which can be very significant, but also the fact that uh, the cow needs to eructate, and these animals may develop a concurrent bloat, which is actually the emergent disease and requires trocarization or something, which will allow it to, to bring the gas up as its rumen continues to swell. One of the significant problems that is seen with choke is in the more chronic stages after the choke the choke has been relieved but the normal healing of the esophagus is fraught with problems especially fibrosis and then you will have a stenotic lesion within the esophagus which is prone to obstruct again and here's a good case of stenosis with dilation of the proximal sections of the esophagus. Something else that may occur in cases of choke is perforation of the esophagus and then you get a suppurative esophagitis and cellulitis with the, within the surrounding soft tissue which is known as 
Phlegmon. Finally, proximal to areas of stricture. There will be areas of dilation which, with a marked thinning of the wall, which are known as pulsion diverticuli. Okay, we're still in cattle. Um, just to show you again, very white lining, shouldn't confuse this, surrounded by muscle, not a lot of soft tissue around it, there's no mesentery, so this is esophagus, you shouldn't confuse this with the intestine, but one thing that it shares with the intestine are these longitudinal folds, and esophageal lesions are very consistent findings in mucosal disease. And in this case, you will often see linear ulcers, which correspond to these longitudinal folds within the esophagus, where friction is high. And remember that uh, bovine pestivirus will infect the basal layer of the mucosa, resulting in necrosis. And friction is a very important determinant as to where you will have areas of ulcers. So ulceration is much more common in areas where there's high levels of friction and that uh, mucosa can just be absolutely torn off. Just to remind you, is the esophagus of an alpaca and camelids also can be infected with bovine pestivirus, giving us lesions that are very significant and very similar to that which is seen in mucosal disease. There are six distinct papillomaviruses in cattle, and one that causes very characteristic lesions is bovine papillomavirus type 4, which causes lesions within the uh, GI tract, especially in the esophagus, causes these papilloma, viral papillomas of the mucosa, often with very fine tendrils or fibrils, which remind me of an artist's paintbrush. Very characteristic for bovine papilloma viruses. While the majority of them are primary epithelial in nature, occasionally you will get these large fibro fibropapillomas primarily in the distal esophagus at the entrance to the rumen. If you are looking for coilocytes on histology, they're usually pretty sparse in these particular viruses but, or viral papillomas. But one of the things that is characteristic of uh, bovine papillomavirus, especially in the GI tract, that when complexed with ingestion of bracken fern in cattle, bovine papillomavirus 4 induced papillomas may undergo malignant progression and become squamous cell carcinoma. The association between bovine papillomavirus type 4 and squamous cell carcinoma was probably first illustrated in cattle. And then uh, rabbit papillomavirus was demonstrated to, uh, to undergo malignant transformation when inoculated into New Zealand white rabbits. And now the connection between uh, papillomavirus infection Leading to transformation and formation of squamous cell carcinomas is very well established in a number of animal species, including uh, uh, genital squamous cell carcinomas in horses, for example. Uh, today, uh, any type of widespread uh, squamous cell carcinoma probably should be examined for the potential for papillomavirus DNA within it. We're looking at the distal esophagus. Here is a large granuloma, and you can see uh, sort of this reddish segment of a nematode parasite within the granuloma. And this is a, uh, a helminth that has a global and ubiquitous distribution known as Spirocerca lupi. Spirocerca lupi is a large spirurid uh, helminth parasite which is spread primarily by 
uh, dung beetles or cockroaches as intermediate hosts, although rodents, reptiles, and chickens can all serve as peritonic hosts. After ingestion, uh, the immature forms of Spirocercolupi will migrate along the aortic adventitia and after two to four weeks will migrate to the submucosa of the esophagus where they form a granuloma. The adult worms will lay their eggs into the lumen of the esophagus. It will go through the GI tract, it will be passed out, and then the life cycle will continue again. While they're pretty good at finding their way to esophagus, you will occasionally see them take a wrong turn, end up with, end up with granulomas in the subcutis, the spinal cord, the kidney, and the bladder in multiple organs. Another thing that is very unique about Spirocerca lupi is that occasionally those granulomas will turn into sarcomas. There's a large sarcoma uh, in the esophagus. Once again, here's that white lining. So, you know, with a, a thick muscular layer. So don't think that this is the aorta, although you can also see tumors in the aorta as well. Another lesion that, that is uh, often associated with the granulomas or the neoplasms, which are caused by Spirocerca lupi, is uh, ventral spondylosis of the overlying thoracic vertebra. Uh, probably the irritation and migration of these, uh, these helminth parasites in the area cause a periosteal reaction in those vessels in the bottom part, or those vertebra and the bottom parts of them get a bit proliferative and shaggy. Spirocerca lupi is only one of a number of parasites which have been associated traditionally with neoplasm formations due to their presence. Other ones would include Opisthorchus felinius and Vivarinii, which are the liver fluke of cats, which can cause a very proliferative lesion of the bile tree. Clonorchus sinensis, which causes cellular carcinoma in humans. This is the Circus fascialaris, which causes hepatic sarcomas in the liver of rats. Trichosomoides crassicata, which will cause uh, squamous cell carcinoma in the, uh, the bladder of rodent hosts. And finally, schistosoma hematobium, which will cause transitional cell carcinomas in, uh, in man. Another nematode parasite, um, which can be seen in the lining of the esophagus, as well as the lining of the oral cavity, uh, usually ruminants, but you can see it in other animal species, dogs, and even primates, including man, is a, uh, a parasite here, which is normally isn't, doesn't show up that nicely, but we have a little blood around it. And this is uh, called Gondulinema pulchrum. Once again, like uh, Spirocerca lupi, it is transmitted um, through the intermediate hosts of, of dung beetles and cockroaches. Transmission of humans is due mostly to unsanitary conditions and the ingestion of the infected coprophagus transport host. So it's never a good idea to eat cockroaches. People have this parasite. Um, they describe a very irritating, somewhat painful process as the, uh, the worm, which does not elicit a systemic response because it lives totally within the esophageal submucosa or the, the uh, uh, mucosa of the oral cavity. Uh, people describe very uncomfortable when that particular agent moves around, and it does move, and uh, probably that's why we have a little bit of, of a hemorrhage in here. So, gondulinema pulchrum, not considered in most species to cause any significant problem. Other helminth uh, parasites that will affect the lining of the esophagus. Here is capillaria, these very fine threadworms here. And uh, we have a, you know, it's not a significant problem, but there is hyperplasia of the esophageal mucosa. This is one of the rule outs. It can be, it can get uh, 
uh, fairly significant and one of the rule outs for proliferative lesions within the esophagus other ones uh, certainly would include pox viral lesions candidiasis and even uh, vitamin A deficiency which we will look at shortly another parasite that uh, uh, that migrates along the esophagus is the arthropod uh, larva of the gadfly hypoderma lineatum. Uh, the adult fly will lay the uh, eggs on the uh, the legs and the hair of the cow. The larva crawl down the uh, hair to the skin which they penetrate and then they wander in the subcutaneous connective tissues uh, gradually increasing in size. Hypoderma lineatum migrates along the uh, submucosa of the esophagus whereas another similar parasite hypoderma bovis will go into the spinal cord and migrate along and eventually often uh, the next spring they will find them their way to the subcutaneous tissue of the back in affected cattle they will uh, uh, form a breathing hole ruining the hide and they will eventually pupate fall out and the life cycle continues here is another case of hypoderma lineatum as it migrates along the generally the submucosal tissues of the esophagus as part of its normal life cycle. Oh, an absolutely beautiful picture of an organism, uh, an apicomplexan parasite that used to be known as Balbania gigantea, now is uh, has has gone through the name Sarcosystis gigantea and is now known as Sarcosystis ovifilis. Um, these large white bulges within the muscle of the esophagus are single myofibers which are massively cram packed with uh, the zoites of Sarcosystis ovifilis and it doesn't really cause much of a problem in affected animals. It's considered an incidental finding which may be seen at slaughter. I mentioned earlier vitamin A deficiency that you can see uh, most commonly seen in uh, uh, poultry but you can see it in just about uh, any animal species and remember those submucosal glands which are especially prominent in the the uh, distal esophagus of the dog. Well, classic lesion of vitamin A deficiency is a metaplasia of those mucus glands to squamous. They become plugged and cystic, and this is what we see in cases of vitamin A deficiency. Here is the esophagus of a ferret and this is a condition which was identified about 15 years ago in ferrets. It's gone by a number of names including disseminated idiopathic uh, myofibrosis or DIM or myofasciitis under which name it was published by Dr. Mike Garner in Veterinary Pathology where he described this particular condition. So DIM is a, a very interesting and unique condition in ferrets uh, which we never really figured out. We don't see it much anymore. It's sort of a historical condition. It, it came and it went and the affected animals were generally young males uh, who had recently been vaccinated and they developed severe pyrexia, uh, leukocytosis, often over a hundred thousand cells per uh, cubic millimeter of blood um, and there was significant infiltration of the mucosa of, excuse me of the muscularis of the esophagus and other skeletal muscles especially those of the back legs with uh, viable neutrophils uh, the uh, when I saw my first cases I have to admit that I thought that we were dealing with some sort of perforating uh, uh, esophagitis and phlegmon but uh, Mike Garner said, no, it looks like the inflammatory cells are coming from the outside in. And, and when I went back and looked, it's like, you know, you're right. The, the mucosa and submucosa were largely devoid of inflammation, and it was mostly confined to the muscularis and serosa. 
and never did figure out what caused this. Um, however, a veterinarian in Europe a number of years later was developing vaccines, uh, vaccines which would essentially result in uh, 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 neutering, uh, neutering vaccines which would attack, of course, the gonads. And, and one of the batches of vaccine that he made, he injected a number of ferrets, and they all got this particular lesion. And when you think about autoimmune diseases, um, you don't think uh, about neutrophils as being a particularly common effector cell. They're usually uh, uh, mandated by lymphocytes and macrophages. But this was one in which the inflammation was uh, predominantly neutrophilic, it was focused on a select number of muscles, including the uh, muscularis of the esophagus. And uh, it was a very high mortality. The animals would live for a while um, and tried everything, including steroids and, and um, antibiotics and everything. And um, luckily, we don't see this disease much anymore. But this is disseminated idiopathic myositis or myofasciitis in ferrets. Okay, so we get into some uh, of the more obscure disorders affecting the esophagus. Well, one more probably we should cover, and this is uh, tissue from a cat, probably from the UK, and there is a uh, diffuse distension of the esophagus. This is not megasophagus. This is a condition known as feline dysautonomia, which is characterized by sort of a widespread uh, degeneration dysfunction of ganglia of the autonomic nervous system. As in other cases of dysautonomia, uh, the cause is generally unknown, but it can affect a wide range of uh, tissues which are innervated by the autonomic nervous system, including the GI tract, resulting in megasophagus and, and uh, uh, diarrhea. Uh, the urinary bladder can uh, also be affected where you have uh, uh, urinary bladder distension and dysfunction and uh, can also affect other parts of the autonomic nervous system resulting in uh, um, non-responsive pupils and, and uh, drooping eyelids and protrusion of the third eyelid, reduced uh, lacrimal secretion in the eye. So there's a number of conditions uh, affected with with feline dysautonomia, uh, <clears throat> including a distension of the esophagus. Within the last 15 years, there has been a number of cases uh, of dysautonomia which have been identified in dogs in the uh, far west by Dr. Donald O'Toole of the Wyoming State Veterinary Laboratory. Pockets of dysautonomia uh, resulting in a number of conditions similar to that which is seen in cats. Here is a dilated esophagus um, with multifocal areas of uh, ulceration due to persistent vomiting and uh, reflux disease. Okay, a number of species of birds have a uh, dilation of the esophagus, which is known as the crop. It's used to store food. It's not unique to birds. It's also was seen in some dinosaurs and some uh, invertebrates like uh, snails and slugs and earthworms and insects may have a crop. Uh, in the birds, usually, as we said, used to store food prior to digestion, but in pigeons and doves, it is lined by uh, uh, a system of glands which slough off high protein and lipid rich uh, cells and it is used to feed baby birds. The process is called crop milk, very dissimilar to milk that is seen in mammalian species with the exception that uh, there may be passage of antibodies and prolactin controls lactation and the production of crop milk in pigeons and doves as well. We're looking here at the, the dilated crop of a citocine bird and <clears throat> in parrots, macaws, and citocines there is a, uh, a condition known as proventricular dilation syndrome. It's a little bit similar to dysautonomia except it is a viral infection caused by a Borna virus which causes 
lymphocytic infiltration and damage to the autonomic nervous system which services the GI tract because of the name proventricular dilation system it generally causes massive dilation of the proventriculus but you can see lymphocytic inflammation of the innervation of other parts of the gut to include the crop and subsequent dysfunction this is proventricular dilation syndrome also has been called McCall wasting disease Here is the crop of a parrot, and you can see that there are numerous papilloma vir or papillomas um, within the uh, crop of this parrot. And, and uh, cytosine birds, especially parrots, can be infected with a herpes virus, which causes papillomas along the GI tract, uh, as well as around the oral cavity and the, uh, the vent. And so this is a case of papilloma associated herpes viral infection in a parrot. As the crop is simply a dilation of the esophagus, um, any of the proliferative diseases that affect the oral cavity and esophagus can also affect the crop. Um, this, is, this particular case is one of Candida albicans infection, also known as crop mycosis, but we can see cases of pox of capillaria infection um, in the crop as well. Very interesting uh, lesion of the crop in uh, finches and sparrows and other passerine birds is granulomatous ingluvitis. Ingluvitis is the fancy word for inflammation of the crop. So granulomatous and necrotizing ingluvitis in finches due to salmonella particularly Salmonella typhimurium. And finally, a, a lesion that uh, this image was taken back in 1962. We don't know much more about this condition than we did back then, but massively dilated crop, usually seen in turkey poults, can occasionally be seen in, in chickens. Um, and the condition is known, it's not associated with any virus that anyone can tell, number of experiments looking at food or uh, humidity or temperature in the developing animals have not yielded any significant and reproducible results. This condition is known as pendulous crop. thought maybe it's simply a genetic uh, problem in some lines of, of turkeys and uh, other poultry. Well, that was 43 minutes on the esophagus. I never thought I would give such a long lecture on the esophagus, but it turns out there's a lot of going on in that particular stretch of the gut. Well, if you think that's a lot, in our next lecture, we're going to start talking about the stomach. I'm going to break those lectures down into the, uh, the stomach, the true carnivore uh, stomach, and then we'll have a separate lecture on the four stomachs of ruminants. So I look forward to putting that together, presenting that to you. I hope you enjoyed uh, this little lecture on the esophagus, and I hope you have a great day.